What's up, Mike? What's going on, gentlemen? How are you? Mike, how you doing? You. Let me tell you something. Good. I am so snobby when it comes to baseball. I think I know everything about baseball. Mike <laughs> so Theron, much. I've said this to him before. This is 100% <laughs> accurate. I've never met a man that knows. I've actually never met Mike in person. We've talked on the phone. We've, we've texted. Uh, but he knows more about baseball than anybody I've ever met, including most former uh, players. But certainly amongst non-players, he knows every player in the minors. He knows every player in the majors. He, he has got it locked out. His show with Jim Duquette is awesome. Okay. I listen Be- all the time. Be- before you answer this, yeah. I need to ask this really quick question. Yeah. We just talked about what goes on in the NBA <laughs> on off-road games, right? Oh, Miami. baseball too. Now, baseball, who is partying? Who parties more <laughs> during the season? Baseball players or NBA players, in your uh, humble yeah. opinion? Well, I mean, it used to be baseball players, but I don't think the kids are wired today the same way that the, the players we grew up watching were. I mean, if they're partying, they're doing it outside of the view of, um, yeah, outside of the view of uh, people who might have cameras and whatnot. So if they're partying, it's mostly in their hotel rooms. But I think there's a lot more uh, time spent playing video games at this point than there is going out and and spending it on the clubs. But like, if you hear the stories from a generation ago of players. Ooh. I mean, they had what twice as many nights uh, on the road as NBA players did and mm. 10 times as many as NFL players did. So there was a lot more room to get into trouble. It's funny. I was when I was working in the minor leagues doing play by play, I would have to. We had a, a, our manager for the Batavia Muck Dogs was a guy <laughs> named. Well, my first year there. <laughs> My first, it's a great team, right? It's the Phillies organization. My first year there in 99, the manager was Greg Legg. Remember Greg Legg, Mike? Yeah. yeah Greg Legg. The name, yeah. And then the second two years was a guy named Frank Klebe, who never, he was not a player. He was actually an amateur boxer, minor league. I, my, part of my job, part of my job working for the team, even though I was the play-by-play guy, was after, at home games, we didn't do play-by-play. I only did, home, I only did road, road games because the owner of the team was a genius. He thought... If you did play by play for the home games, nobody would come to the game, which was stupid, but whatever. Yeah. So my job for home games, I would do like on field promotions and, you know, PR stuff. And then my job was to bring two cases of beer to Frank Klebe <laughs> in the locker room because nobody drinks beer like baseball players. Mike, is that is that not correct? <laughs> Especially managers. I mean, that is. That is true. That has been historically the case, and nobody can put it away. In uh, listen, they do a really good job of hiding it too. I would say, like um, having been on team charter buses, like there's almost always a beverage um, in somebody's hand. So, I mean, listen, you got to wind down after three and a half hours, right? But yeah, um, baseball managers, without a doubt, they have a long history of being able to um, being able to uh, finish off a, a, a twelve pack in record time. That's right. <laughs> Now, Mike, you say three and a half hours, but now, hopefully, games will not be as long, right? So far in spring training, the average game through this time last year is down 25 minutes, I believe. I, th- I thought, I believe I saw yesterday. Correct. What is what is your take on this, and do you think the, the change with the clock uh, and the other rules, but especially the clock, will will dramatically change the time once we get to the regular season? Or will it be not as big a gap? Well, I mean, I think I think it better. I mean, you know, what I mean, like I think that's one of the things that they're fighting is that the games have been have, have crept up in time over the last forty years. I mean, they have something like eight thousand games of data uh, on this um, to look at through the minor leagues, and they saw a significant reduction, more than twenty five minutes. Um, in you know the cases of the extreme pitch clock last year now there's a i think what a couple extra seconds this year for major league players and i don't know that it's it's necessarily going to be quite to the same level it is right now in terms of um how many you know how short the games are i think once <laughs> pitchers figure out that they have you know the 20 seconds is actually a fairly long time with men on base i think you'll see start to use it a little better but listen the the time of games has been a huge issue and i think it's it's um, you know, it, it it gets exacerbated in the postseason when you hear people complain about how late the games start because kids can't stay up to the end. If they're playing two hour and forty minute games, it makes a big difference on whether or not you can let your kids stay up to the end of the game. I think it's over the case in the course of the regular season, right? It makes it more likely for you to be able to stay to watch the end of the game if you go and attend it. So I think it's trending in the right direction. My hope is that it stays pretty similar and that we end up, you know, seeing at least a median time in the two forties. 
um, because I think it would be a huge boost to the game. And, and listen, I think they're looking at this from the standpoint of not just the in-stadium experience being better if folks can be there to the end of games, but like the only thing that people watch live on television anymore is sports, right? And so if you can find a way to fit into television windows better, there's a chance to make more money, um, you know, whether it's via streaming outlets or via, you know, more traditional broadcast. I think all of those things are important for the future there. Mike, when you look at the, the all the changes, like I, I haven't seen any as much changes to the core part of the game ever. Like, you know, in, in the NFL, yeah. usually they roll these things out very quickly. Uh, excuse me, oh, roll them out slowly over time so people can adjust to them. But they've changed a lot of things from the shift to the base sizes uh, to the clock. What ways do you believe that teams are going to try to make this a competitive advantage? Mm-hmm. Do you think teams are going to put their, their roster or their personnel or any sort of extra strategy into making this like something that they do well, like maybe stealing bases or, or being very aggressive on a base pass? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the aggressive on the base paths is something that's worth watching, right? Because there's a limit now on the number of uh, pickoffs that teams have right. too, right? So I think that's another that's another big part of of this, and this is something we saw in the minor leagues that it increased um, that it increased um, the the amount of stolen base attempts, and even early in spring training, we've seen nearly one more attempt per game. You know, but the last three years we've seen the highest success rate in stolen base. Attempt, uh, uh, on stolen bases in Major League history. We just have seen fewer attempts than ever before. So I think there's a hope that that will change. As to what it means, I mean, for defense, I think you're seeing teams start to value athleticism a little bit more at second base than they have over the last you know six or seven years where they've been able to position that guy in, in shallow right and basically trade him like a, uh, a third baseman, uh, kind of an old school third baseman with a lack of range. I think you'll see some of that change. I'm still skeptical that the shift rules are going to have that much impact on the pace of play or on the quality of play because I just don't think we saw that big an impact in the minor leagues. But we'll see what happens. The bigger bases, I mean, it's a safety thing as much as anything. Maybe it makes a bang-bang play, go to the runner a little bit more. Certainly the stolen base success rate has been higher in spring training this year than it was last year by by almost 10%. I mean, it went from 72% to like 82% so far. But it's also spring training, so I would take that with a heaping grain of salt. So um, they would like the game to look more like it did in the 80s, I think, which is, you know, lots of, of... um, you know, super athletic players that are able to take advantage of uh, speed and, and, you know, doubles and triples is what their market research shows. The league's market research shows what fans want. I always worry about one part of this, which is that everybody wants baseball to look like it did when they were 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, right? Like, we, that's we're nostalgic for it. And shoehorning too much of that in can be a problem. And I'm guilty of it, too. I mean, I'm a child of the 80s. That's my favorite style of play. Mm-hmm. But I do worry that we spend too much time trying to, to retrofit the game to what we wanted it to be or what we remember it to be versus what it actually is or needs to be going forward. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping that there's a happy medium there with it where we see an increase in those athletic plays, but that it isn't at the – that we just don't try and force the issue too much so that it takes away what with some of the things that that are really special in the game now, which is the power uh, for both pitchers and hitters. Mike, you was talking about how in spring training, you know, the stolen bases has gone up and you take that with a grain of salt. What is something that a casual fan can look at that can translate to that's in spring training that translates to the regular season? (laughs) Absolutely nothing. (laughs) I think that's... I mean, like, I think that's like I play this game every spring. I get excited. Oh, this guy's having an awesome spring. Hey, let's do this. And you know what it means? Absolutely nothing. I, I mean, just n- nothing. Nothing results wise. Now, I think the time of game stuff. I think that might actually translate. I think there's some correlation there. Um, I think you'll see that have an impact. So I'm that I'm less. That would be the one thing from a casual fan. But in terms of the way the game is played or the way results are or the way the ball is flying out of the ballpark or not flying out of the ballpark. I mean, th- like there's literally nothing to be gained for fans from a statistical advantage other than, Hey, baseball's back and it's cold a lot of places. And it lo- it, and it feels like spring is coming. If you get to see players playing in warm weather. Hey Mike, baseball, baseball has a problem as far as it relates, uh, aligns with being relevant to the today's market. Basketball has done a great mm-hmm. job. Football has done a great job with aligning 
uh, the sport with the fans. Baseball has been slow to the table, slow to the table, getting games out to the, to the natural public so they can uh, hone in on people. Not like the times when when it was really locked in, I would say in my last time when, when Sosa and Bonds and McGuire right. and that group, then people were paying attention. How is baseball going to correct it? Because I don't think the, the, the making the bases larger, shortening the game is going to do a little bit, but there's got to be that connectivity between fans, current fans, and today's game, today's media market with the, with the current way the game is being played. How are they, they going to address that? Well, I mean, think about that time that you're talking about, too. I mean, what was it that ended up leading to that, right? I mean, we ended up with, with a decade-long steroid scandal in baseball that at least was somewhat responsible for that resurgence. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to potentially go about it, because I agree with you. I think it's, you know, baseball's popularity is waning a little bit. It is it is certainly an older audience. Let's put it that way, that, that, that whatever over the last 20 years, whenever they've done um, studies on whose audience is the oldest, baseballs has been older by a wide margin. And certainly the, the demographic that um, the age demographic that MLB searches for is what the NBA has, right? They want younger fans. That's more buying power. It's more li- long-term fans. It's more lifelong. So I think Part of it is the gameplay. I do think the shorter games is going to make it more likely that casual fans will be uh, interested in more games than they have been. You know, in postseason, maybe you see them getting into five, six games a year, something like that. That's not insignificant. I think one of the challenges in marketing the sport is that baseball has become very regionalized. Um, And I think the other thing is that there's just not a whole lot of free time for players to be able to do things like commercials, right? Like if you're playing 162 games in 187 games uh, days, when's the downtime, you know, four of those off days are at the all-star break. Right. So, so I think there's challenges in trying to get those stars out there, but I, I think, you know, they kind of lucked into the home run race and that it was something that happened. And I realized this, this is a double-edged sword, but it happened organically and that the home runs being hit were incredible, even if the, 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 the players weren't organic. But I think that there's, I think, you know, I think one of the things that they will try and do is try and showcase the crazy athleticism and the crazy power of the game. And, and I think you're starting to see that a little bit on social media, um, you know, over the last five or six years, as you, you know, if you follow like the pitching ninja and you see the nasty pitches, I think those are things that can get people excited in bits, I think making it more accessible. And I think, and this is kind of a longer term thing and it has to deal with, with something that, you know, three of the four major sports are dealing with and the regional sports networks demise is getting rid of the blackouts, which is something that yeah, will yes, probably yeah. happen within the next couple yeah. of years. The commissioner has been pretty consistent in the last year and a half, really since before the lockout was done, that the number one priority for Major League Baseball is reach. They need to get the game into right. more people's hands. They need to get it on devices the younger fans are watching it. So I think all of those things, it's not a great answer, I know, but, I mean, that's, that's kind of where they're working at, and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to see if they can, try enough different things that one of them catches hold and people can get excited about the game. Because you, you have to, uh, one of the problems I see is just this, you have to connect the fans with the players and the faces. It, like the NBA, you know who the faces are. So when they come on a commercial, it's easy for a marketer to go to mm-hmm. who's yeah. the NBA player because you're going to know the face of Draymond Green. You're going to know, even Dylan Brooks, you're going to you're gonna know what those faces look like. The baseball guys, you don't know what they look like. They could be out right. of the club above me. I wouldn't even know what they Except were. Except Judge. You know right, what he looks right. like. You know yeah. Judge. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you, you can't name. The casual fan so, yeah. especially yeah. doesn't know. Yes. Yeah. I think it's totally fair. I mean, I think, yeah. I think you know, the biggest stars you're going to be able to recognize. Like, everybody knows who Shohei Otani is, right? Yeah, like sure. That's, that's, and that's, I think that's good that you have a player like that. But, like, you know, I love Mike Trout. Mike Trout's arguably the greatest player in the last 50 years. And he's going to go down as one of the all-time greats. But I'm not sure that anybody could pick him out of a lineup. He's Mm-mm. just like he's not wired that way, right? Like he's yeah. not this huge, engaging personality. And I think the other thing, and you hit on something there that that I'm wondering the changes in television do this is that you know the NBA is kind of a national game, right? Like yeah. everybody's. I mean, the 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 podcast conversation between Brooks and Draymond last night. Oh, that was, was like that, It was hilarious, but it was <laughs> happening in a national television right. game, right? <laughs> right. And so. Like there are limits, I think, because of the way baseball has become regionalized, and it's been great for these 
RSNs because the, the regional sports networks, because it's a ton of programming, right? Like back in the day when I first started in, in radio that had major league teams, like it was the one thing that made money on the radio. And it's because it was every single day. Right. What's well, tough to create that or do that over the course of six months nationally and have everybody follow it. So, yeah, I think there are, there are definitely ways that they have to market the stars better. I don't, I'm not smart enough to know how to go about that. I should ask my wife. She's a marketing executive. She's probably got some better ideas on it than I do. <laughs> go ahead, McNuggets. You got a question for Mike? I do, Mike. So as Bull had told us throughout this whole week, you know more about baseball on a national level than, than anyone he knows. And Bull knows Yeah, he's baseball. full so of it. If he gives you I'm that not. endorsement, then I have to ask you this. We look sure. at Jose here in Cleveland as yeah. almost a savior for taking $150, $200 million less than some of the other top third basemen in baseball. Based on his contract, could you make the argument that Jose might actually be the single most valuable player in the entire league? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I hear what you're saying in that. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to tie it to dollars, sure. I mean, you're talking about, you know, one of probably the 10 to 15 best players in the game. Um, and I know, listen, like, like it's been really hard to get guys to um, – to stay in Cleveland, right? And so, like, the thing that was most important, it seems like, for for Jose was to stay put, right? So, Jose's there. You're going to have him for the next, you know, several years as, as one of the stars of that team. Um, you know, like, if you're going to compare it to other free agent contracts or potential free agent contracts, yeah, he left a lot of money on the table. It was a pre-free agent deal, so you're probably going to sign for less money anyway when you do that than if you hit the market. So, I guess you could say that, but I don't, I don't know that you need to look at it as the dollar value. I think we spend too much time looking at the dollar value on players and all that. Like if there's any indication of what teams can actually spend, you should look at the San Diego Padres. And so anytime we talk about an over a, a player that is exceeding value um, based on the contract that they've signed, it's really another win for the owners. And yeah. so I, I think looking at it that way, I think we're starting to evolve in some of that and looking at, you know, where that those numbers come from or, or where, what those numbers should be for players. Listen, Jose took what he was going to be comfortable with and what's great for his family. I'm happy for him. It's a second generation contract. He'd already been on one extension with, with the guardians. Like I'm excited for guardians fans that they have this superstar player to continue to build around. Who's probably going to retire in a guardians uniform. And um, you know, like, I don't want to get too far ahead of it, but his numbers are going to look pretty good against third baseman historically when he retires. Like, he's a potential Hall of Famer. He really is. I mean, he's been in the mix for MVP, what, all but two years in the last six? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's great to have that, but I wouldn't put the dollar value behind it. I would just say that, like, you have one of the superstars who is committed to Guardians fans and has a chance to, to you know, on a pretty good team, finally break that World Series drought. And I, I love, I agree with you, Mike, 100%, because I hate when fans and fellow media members give passes to owners for not spending money. I hate that. And I rip the Dolans for not spending money. The one thing I will credit the Dolans for is they hire good people, and outside of the budget having a, a limit, they let them yeah. do their job. They stay, Chris Antonetti and Mike Chernoff, you know, it's not like our football owner here, Jimmy Haslam, is a meddler. He gets involved in day-to-day. -day. He's a pain in the ass. Dolan doesn't do any of that. Mm. And because of that, you know, even with, the, with the, the force of a low penalty, it's amazing how good a front office this team has. We look at, I look at them in Tampa Bay as the models for all Major League Baseball. Do you look at those two franchises yeah. as the models as well? I mean, if you think about it, like, what, what's the, like, like, when I was growing up, like, we already established I'm a child of the 80s, right? Which means yeah. I'm an old. But, like, the, 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 the Indians sucked, like, oh. for most of my life, right? Yes. Until you get to the 90s. And since then, what have they had? Maybe two, three 90 loss seasons in 30 years, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I think it's a testament to the front office they have. I agree with you. And I, I love Chris Antonetti. I love Mike Chernoff. I think they do a tremendous job. And you're right. It's budget that is what's limited them. You know, even this winter where they clearly were not being given the resources that they needed to, to take that team to the next level, they made pretty smart plays with Josh Bell and Mike Zanino. And they're fortunate that they've developed this unbelievable pitching program, which should be, it really is the envy of every team in baseball. So um, I think they're in a lot of respects, a model franchise. I mean, I think if, to be a model franchise, you need an owner that's 
committed financially as well, I think. So that's kind of what pulls them back. But from the way they, they work as a front office, I think absolutely it's clear. And I, and I do think it's going to be interesting to see what happens if David Blitzer are involved in the ownership group now yeah. and how that evolves over the next three, four, five years. Is there a bigger investment into payroll? Is there a bigger push? Does he have a little Peter Seidler in him who's the, the, the managing partner of the Padres? Do they start to, to push more towards the middle of the pack even in payroll when they have a chance? Because they've done that before. Yep. Starting to get to that point with this young group, right? You're going to need to augment it with some significant free agents outside to get over the top. And that's whether it's this year or next year, that that has to start happening for this team. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, like one guy, Ahmed Rosario, is going to be a free agent at the end of the year. And I know we know they have Gabriel Arias and they have Rocchio and they have all these great prospects. But Ahmed Rosario is one of the most important guys in this locker room. Like, I already know he's good. And I don't have to pay him crazy money because he doesn't hit for power. So he's not getting insane money. But the Guardians have, there's no excuse to me. They should be able to re-sign Ahmed Rosario. And I, but like if I had to bet right now, I bet that they don't. Now you're not going to trade him probably because you're going to be a contender. But it's a shame. Like he's a guy, he's not getting 30 million a year. Like I don't know what he's going to get exactly, but like they should be able to to pay Ahmed Rosario. I think. What What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I think they should. I, yeah. I mean, I think because of some of what you've talked about, though, like their their depth is in pitching and players up the middle, right? Yeah. So, does it make more sense to you know? I, I mean, I was a little bit surprised to be honest that they didn't trade Rosario this winter. I think that's yes. probably a testament to his role in the clubhouse as much as anything. Um, but I think they're you know like I like Rosario a lot, but I think you can upgrade one of those up the middle positions if you want, either internally or externally, and that's why I'm not convinced Rosario stays there. Not to mention I think Jimenez can play short. I mean, you went through this what ten years ago, fifteen years ago with Estrebel Cabrera, right? Like Cabrera was turned out to be a terrific defensive shortstop for a number of years after breaking in as a second baseman. And I think Jimenez is kind of cut from the same cloth in that regard. But, um, you know, you're right. He's not going to be super expensive. I mean, he's probably, I, I mean, I would guess Rosario is surprisingly young, right? Like for a guy who's been on the scene for right. as long as he has. So, yeah. you know, like five and 75 is a pretty modest commitment for a free agent. It's just that, you know, what's the biggest deal in franchise history for a uh, for and Carnacion. An agent and Carnacion, right? Yeah. Three and 60. So, yeah, it's mm. funny that you say five and 75 because I literally said yesterday, look at the Andrew Benatendi contract. That's yeah. what you pay Ahmed Rosario, which I think was five for 75 or something like that. Maybe it was 80. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know exactly. But yeah. Somewhere in that in that neck of the woods. In terms, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, it's funny because they added Bell, they added Zanino. I think the lineup's pretty good. I, I, I look at this team and I'm like, I know they got all this good young pitching. I'd love them to get at the trade deadline, assuming they're leading the division or something like that. I'd love them to trade some of their prospect depth, depth to get a veteran because I don't trust Savali and I don't trust Plesak and I want Quantrill to be my four in the playoffs. I love McKenzie. I love Bieber. I want them to go get a veteran third starter for the postseason. Uh, do you see that as something they could use and might do? No? no, I think they need to upgrade their offense in the postseason. I mean, I think I, Gavin Williams is coming quickly, and Gavin okay. Williams is better than Savali and Plesak, I think. I mean, yeah. I, I, Gavin Williams is a monster. I think he's got a chance to be an impactful starter on nice. the level of what McKenzie is. Uh, wow. And that's going back to college. Like, there was a, there was a really – famous super regional game when he was at ECU where he went toe to toe with with Kumar Rocker and Williams stuff is exceptional I would not be surprised if he's up towards the end of the year I don't know that I would look at their rotation as being a key for the postseason I have bigger questions about their offense I mean what they did last year was a pretty neat trick right they singled their way to the postseason I don't know that you can do that consistently they don't walk very much. They really don't have any impact power. I think they have a big hole in right field. I'm not convinced that Oscar Gonzalez, based on his approach, is going to be an everyday player. So okay. I think targeting a bat at the deadline makes all the sense in the world. I, I, you know, like I was actually a little surprised that they weren't in heavier on Juan Soto a year ago because he was such a fit for so much what they needed. And to your point, they have a terrific farm system yep. that they could have dealt from. Now, obviously, the Padres paid an extreme premium for that. But if you're looking at at a field that could be available to the deadline, like the 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 Guardians could meet the asking price 
for Brian Reynolds if the Pirates decide to trade him. And I don't know that they're necessarily him. going to. He'd be a tremendous yes. fit as a switch hitter. He gets on base, has a little bit of power, very good in a corner. Like, that guy is a great fit. They have the, the Ben Sherrington, who's the general manager of the Pirates, got his start in the Cleveland organization. They have a lot of history with him. Like, that's the kind of guy that I think they could target if Pittsburgh moves him. And they, even with, like, the injury to Espino and the idea that Williams is untouchable, like, th- there are a number of players there that would be of interest, I think. Like, I would not be opposed to using, like, a George Valera to try and start a deal or, or Valera and Rocchio. Um, I think Pittsburgh needs some some um, position player help as much as they need, you know, pitching help. You know, Angel Martinez was really good in the fall league. Like, that's another guy that I think the Guardians could, could potentially move because they have so much depth up the middle. So there's a number of pieces that they could move to be able to get somebody like that and still keep a significant amount of depth. It's just a matter of if and when they pull the trigger on something like that. You know, you know, Mike, let me just uh, as you really quickly before we, we let you go. Great stuff. And Bull is so happy that you mentioned this guy because he's been lobbying for Reynolds for <laughs> I've oh, been the last for seven, He's such a good seven, fit. Seven <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, you know, when I grew up, my favorite sport was baseball. I started playing baseball when I was six, play, play, six played all the way through high school. And the glory days, you mentioned the 80s and, and the, you know, those days where you, you had Frank Thomas's and the Griffey's and and the Paul Merrill's and, and all, all the big time names that we, we were comfortable talking with. We look back at the heyday. The one thing that I always look at that and, and say is the reason that was so special is because fringe people like home runs. Fringe fans don't really care about singles or doubles. They don't <laughs> they don't even like strikeouts. They want to right. see five or six, seven guys hit 50 home runs. And then we're like, wow, let me root <laughs> for my guy because I want to see him win the title. Now, right. for me, you can't just hand people steroids anymore. You can't just turn <laughs> the other way, look the other way. That's not going to work. Now, what are some ways that the MLB can, can increase home run? Maybe lowering the mound. I don't know. Messing with the strike zone a little bit. Do, do you think that they would ever do something in the way that the mm. NBA did it in saying, all right, you can't touch Michael Jordan anymore because people want to see him score? Or in the NFL saying, you can't touch a yeah. quarterback because quarterbacks throw the ball and that's what people that sells people franchise quarterbacks came out of the necessity to say there's a person that is really good here he goes point to him right there yeah. baseball with 50 home runs I automatically know who good I, I just can yeah. see it. do you think they'll ever do anything to try to increase home runs without the out steroids it's it's funny because what they've done the last couple of years is tried to alter the the baseball so that they could reduce the number of home runs because 17, 18, 19 in particular, I think even going back to 2016, we saw some of the highest non-steroid era home run rates in baseball history. And the ball was a little um, juicy, let's say. So <laughs> what they've done is they've tried to deaden it a little bit. So like, here's some of the things that we've learned about the baseball. Some of this we already knew, right? They make the baseballs in Costa Rica. They're all handmade, which is pretty incredible. Like that you think yeah, about that, that it's there's crazy. not a machine that puts them out. And as a result, there's a wide variation in what's acceptable for a baseball that makes its way into a major league game. And what was happening is something had changed in the, the process that had made the core tighter. And so they were acting more like titleists. And so you were seeing, um, you're seeing the ball fly the other way and, and you're just not seeing that to the same level over the course of the 21 and certainly the 22 season. So it's a really tricky line because they want to keep the integrity of the game together. And the league is super sensitive to the fact that the baseball has been altered seemingly every year and nobody really knows what the ball is going to be like from season to season. Um, so they, they, they don't like that either. They've tried to tighten up the parameters on what makes a legal baseball, and they're doing what they can for that. But I also I agree with you. Like I think one of the things, college baseball. I'm a big college baseball guy, right? I do college baseball games. I host a college baseball show. Um, college baseball is seeing home run rates that we haven't seen since um, the Nitro Bat era, back when they had the dro- the well, bull. Remember this? The drop fives, right? Like Ooh. the ones that were like, you had the 34. 34- bat that was like 28 ounces Ooh, right the man. drop six and like and then like the barrels were like the size of my forearms right so <laughs> it's like those big red bats so like, 
seeing that in in college baseball right now and one of the things that it has brought is the threat of the late home run is a big deal for fans because you want to be able to see your team have a chance if they're down three in the eighth Mm -hmm. you don't want to think that it's out of the realm of possibility that anyone in your lineup can get the game even so i think that's I think it's a reasonable point. I think it's a it's actually a really good one. I think it's one of the things that the league is kind of fighting against that I don't know that they need to be fighting against because fans like dingers, right? Pitchers don't like dingers. Maybe they have too yeah. many pitchers that are, are consulting uh, <laughs> side, but man, like home runs are exciting and home runs win ball games. Yeah. Mike, last thing real quick. We've got 15 seconds. I have the third pick in my fantasy baseball draft. Do I take Jose Ramirez or Trey Turner? I have no idea. I don't Come on, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike, shut that down. He was trying to get a freebie, Mike. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. He was trying to get a freebie. No, no, no. I mean, I'm <laughs> happy to give free advice, but just not on fantasy baseball. That is quick outside. I'm out of luck. Thanks, Mike. Great job. Yeah. Right, See you guys. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. We're going to go for